So I'm really, really happy to be here at SOAS. And a lot of my research, um, as Nitya mentioned, focuses on uh, forced labor, unfree labor in the global economy. And I've really been influenced and love a lot of the excellent work that's done here at SOAS on those topics, um, such as by Alessandra, Jens Lert, different people uh, in different departments here. Um, and it's been really influential uh, for me in, in my work. So it's really exciting uh, to be here today, and I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Uh, for me, this seminar comes at a perfect time because I'm right in the middle of writing a new book. Um, and by the middle, I mean literally three out of six chapters. So just at the point, for any of you who have written books, you'll know that that's the point, I think, where you start to lose perspective on your full argument and you start to be a little bit buried down in some of the detail. Um, and so it's an excellent moment for me uh, to get some feedback and to get some ideas uh, from you all and hopefully... Um, put me a little bit back on track uh, with the work. So it's very much a work in progress, um, and I'm really looking forward to your thoughts and ideas. So the book that I'm writing is uh, forthcoming with Polity, um, and it's a big picture book. What it really looks at is I'm looking at the slew of public and private governance initiatives that have emerged over the past five years or so to combat unfree labor in global supply chains. So as many of you will know, the challenge of governing labor standards in the global economy today is very high, uh, particularly as activists have become very adept at linking uh, practices that are, they consider to be modern slavery or severe forms of labor exploitation uh, directly back to the big brands who are leading some of these global supply chains. Um, and so like Nike and Walmart. So to name just a few examples, there have been uh, several recent incidents. One was, you may have seen in uh, The Guardian, there was a big expose after a six month uh, journalistic investigation um, of widespread modern slavery in the Thai prawn industry. Um, and there was also uh, a documentation of how those prawns that were tainted by slave labor uh, ended up in, in supermarkets like Walmart, Tesco, Costco, etc. Um, Apple has recently come under fire for uh, endemic debt bondage at some of its major factories in, uh, in China and skyrocketing death rates for workers constructing stadiums for Qatar's uh, World Cup we keep seeing in the news. So there have been these incidents that have drawn international attention uh, to the severe labor exploitation that's being fueled by discount-driven consumer markets. And as uh, activists and others have started to call for greater uh, corporate transparency and accountability, um, governments have started to pass a whole wave of new legislation um, to address what they're calling modern slavery and to bolster transparency in global corporate supply chains. So in the UK last year in 2015, we had a new law called the Modern Slavery Act. Um, at the same time as you've had all these public initiatives, you've also had all of these private initiatives. So companies have gone bananas, really. They've just invested millions and millions of dollars in these new corporate social responsibility programs to, uh, to tackle slavery. And they've expanded ethical auditing initiatives. Uh, they've partnered up with NGOs. They're doing all sorts of things to, uh, to, to combat, uh, prevent, and address slavery in their supply chains which is a market shift, I would say, um, from the previous years where companies have denied any responsibility or any you know, link at all with these types of practices. But by most measures and across many sectors and regions, labor exploitation remains endemic. So what I was really interested in in this book is to really look at you know, why aren't these governance efforts working, uh, and more specifically, in whose interests are they working? Um, and if it has been widely documented by scholars, these types of efforts uh, don't seem to be doing much to prevent or eradicate labor exploitation in global supply chains, then what are companies and governments getting out of them? Why are they investing so heavily in anti-slavery initiatives? Um, and relatedly, it raises questions about if these you know, are the main governance efforts that are being taken uh, to address uh, labor governance in supply chains, and they don't seem to be working. What kinds of supply chain governance is needed to protect uh, the world's workers, and especially the most vulnerable ones? So just to say a little bit about my theory, uh, the sort of theoretical interests of my book, as I mentioned, a lot of my previous work has focused on unfree labor. Um, and my current project that I'm working on alongside this book, which is uh, an ESRC project, is looking at the business of unfree labor in global tea and cocoa supply chains. So a lot of my work has been sort of really interested in the character 
uh, and role of unfree labor within uh, the global capitalist economy. Um, I've, I've looked specifically at prison labor uh, uh, in the U.S. Uh, state uh, and sought to understand it in a, in a historical perspective, uh, etc. But in this book, I'm not focusing on the character of unfree labor. Um, this is not a book about um, you know, the unfree labor debates or the nature of contemporary unfree labor or its relation to capitalism. My theoretical concern in this book is much more uh, in how the international political economy literature um, is dealing with the problem of labor standards and global supply chains. And so my theoretical ambition um, really comes from a dissatisfaction with the literature on global supply chains and global supply chain governance, um, which although in its early iterations in the works of people like Wallerstein and others, uh, was centrally concerned with questions around power and distribution uh, and agency, uh, et cetera, and kind of big picture questions about global capitalism and production, in recent years, this literature has evolved on highly technocratic lines of inquiry, um, especially in regards to labor standards. So the starting point, uh, there's just, you know, study after study after study that's sort of saying, okay, well, if we look at this initiative over this five-year period, um, what, what's not quite working about it? How could it be made to work better? So there's a lot of focus on sort of problem solving within these initiatives. The starting point is that globalization has created long, complex supply chains. And it's created a situation in which developing countries lack the capacity or the willingness to enforce labor standards uh, in their factories. So we need multinational corporations who are at the head of these chains like Walmart and Nike, etc., cetera, um, to get in there and to, to uh, raise labor standards along the supply chain. And we need Western governments uh, like the US and the UK to support and steer these efforts, such as through legislation that's going to strengthen corporate social responsibility. Um, and this framing of the problem, I think, tends to overlook a number of questions that are important. One of them is the question of why supply chains have become so complex and so long in the first place, um, and the agency in, of companies and industry actors in reorganizing global production in this way uh, in the first place. Um, after all, corporations themselves have given rise to this complexity and also to very high levels of subcontracting uh, within many product and labor supply chains as they've restructured production in recent decades to cut costs and reduce uh, legal ownership to curtail their liability. So to put it simply, I'm interested in uh, challenging some of the problems with how the, the global value chain theoretical approach conceptualizes the problems of labor standards governance. Um, so for the sake of time, I'll just name three of my sort of bones to pick with this literature here. Um, the first is that the literature tends to overlook the disproportionate power of industry actors in the inception, design, and implementation of both public and private governance initiatives. Um, secondly, it's tended to discount the role of states and corporations in actively engineering uh, weak corporate accountability regimes that have been used to justify the rise of private governance. So the argument is, well, companies need to step in and they need to raise labor standards in the supply chains because there's no public governance. Um, but that also tends to overlook the role of these actors and of political economic processes in actually creating those gaps in the first place. And third, there's been very limited recognition that many of the governance initiatives that they're focusing their studies on um, are not actually designed to address some of the problems that they're purported to, to address. Um, and if you look at the structure of them very carefully, um, th there's, there's very little reason to believe that, they're, that these corporate social responsibility initiatives are genuinely uh, meant to do the things that, that they're said to do. And so I think we need to stop taking them quite as much on face value, and we need to think about how some of these initiatives are actually structured in ways that reinforce governance deficits surrounding labor standards uh, rather than resolving them. So theoretically, I'm interested to build on global political economy scholarship, uh, like uh, the work of Claire Cutler, Suzanne Soderberg, Marcus Taylor, and others, um, who have really tried to emphasize and understand the politics and power dynamics of the shifts through which companies have become empowered to set and enforce their own rules. And I'm interested in the links between these anti-slavery initiatives and the broader sort of set of pol policy transformations asso associated with neoliberalization in the last several decades, uh, through which states have redefined their relationship to market actors. And I think that the anti-slavery uh, sort of 
frenzy that's happening at the moment gives us some really interesting insights into those uh, sets of processes. So in my presentation for the rest of today, I'm going to focus uh, on three things. The first is how the business of forced labor is being understood and defined um, by the governments and companies who are setting up these initiatives. The second is on the corporate-led initiatives, so what I'm calling private governance initiatives, which are these corporate CSR um, types of initiatives. And the third is on recent public legislation that's uh, meant to combat forced labor in supply chains. So that's like the U UK's Modern Slavery Act, etc. Um, just to begin, I think it's important to understand how forced labor is being um, defined within these initiatives. So most governments and corporate initiatives are anchored in the International Labor Organization's 1930 definition of forced labor. Uh, which basically has two main components, that the labor is involuntary and that it is enacted under the menace of penalty. And there are a number of analytical and, and practical and political problems um, associated with this definition, which have been really, really well articulated in the unfree labor literature. Um, so I'm not going to go into them here. But the point of bringing this up here is to note that the way that they're understanding uh, the problem within these initiatives is as something that can be uh, neatly separated from labor exploitation more broadly. So you have labor exploitation, then you have forced labor, and that's a separate problem. And it's one that can be addressed without necessarily needing to tackle labor exploitation more broadly. And fo following on from that, um, most of the initiatives... Uh, so when you read the company reports and you read the, the government reports, most of them are using the ILO's research to define the scope and prevalence of the problem. Um, so according to the ILO, there's 21 million people subjected to forced labor today in the global economy. And they think that 18.7 million of those, uh, roughly 90%, are exploited within the private economy, as opposed to by states or in forced sexual exploitation. Um, the numbers are a little bit shaky. They've been criticized by scholars, but they're nevertheless the, the most reliable estimates that we have. Um, and, um, and, and it's important in the sense that what they're conceptualizing as the problem is the fact that you have 18.7 million people who are being exploited uh, in forced labor situations in the private economy. So that's by companies or individuals. Uh, and that, that is who they're trying to help with these initiatives. Um, we also have a lot of much better data and information about the patterns of forced labor within global supply chains. And what we know, um, mostly through scholarship and anthropology, sociology, business, uh, and politics, is that dozens of commodities are heavily dependent on various forms of unfree labor today. Uh, these commodities include coffee, charcoal, cocoa, uh, fish, nuts, timber, diamonds, coltan, uh, and several others. Um, and then these commodities feed into the product production chains of major companies, including those who are producing things like jewelry, computers, phones, uh, and food that we buy at the grocery store, just to name a few. And again, the evidence base here um, on, on, on the patterns of unfree labor within these actual supply chains is becoming quite good. Uh, so researchers um, like Neil Howard at the UI have done really good first-hand ethnographic work alongside victims of unfree labor and have then traced up the supply chain. So we're starting to understand the patterns around why and how unfree labor is emerging and is sustained within these types of industries. Um, as I mentioned, the uh, global value chain literature frequently portrays the problem of unfree labor as one where the problem is really that global value chains have become incredibly long and incredibly complex. And so even companies who really want to uh, prevent and address forced labor in supply chains have difficulty doing so. Um, so there's very often reference to this type of illustration, uh, which is of a laptop computer commodity chain. And uh, I mean, it is significant that if you have, for instance, an iPhone, it travels through roughly 200 different factories uh, across 
you know, dozens of national boundaries before it ends up being sold uh, in a retail store. So there's a lot of complexity in terms of how goods are made. And that's frequently um, the main explanation for why it's been so difficult to tackle the problem of forced labor in these supply chains. Um, so corporations and governments have, have framed the problem in this way, emphasizing that companies don't own these factories and production sites uh, that create their products. And this uh, undermines their ability to uh, ensure that standards are flowing across these complex uh, global networks. And finally, I just want to point out here that the, the notion that the problem of forced labor relates to shortcomings associated primarily with those supplier firms and also with governments in the global south is reflected in how the problem is measured and depicted by the International Labor Organization, uh, companies, and, and other governments. So this is an International Labor Organization map from 2012, which relates to the estimate that I, I cited earlier, um, where they're showing that um, uh, forced labor is appearing as basically a developing country problem. Um, it's especially concentrated in Africa and in Asia. Um, and there's really no mention and no emphasis on you know, the fact that a lot of that uh, labor with, concentrated within those industries is supplying into global value chains as well as in domestic value chains, um, but that are tied to global economic relationships. Uh, so there's very much an emphasis on regions, um, and this is how this type of problem is typically portrayed. What is talked about a lot less often uh, by uh, government and by companies is, you know, getting into the main innovation and getting into understanding why global value chains have evolved the way that they've evolved. Um, so, for instance, the main innovation behind the global retail business model, uh, which has been to allow companies to transcend nationally based labor and environmental legislation uh, through various forms of outsourcing, various forms of subcontracting, um, and it's been allowing those companies to transfer risk legal liability, as well as all of the duties associated with employment onto supplier firms. Uh, but then those firms very often receive a very small percentage of the profits uh, associated with the goods that are being produced. So this chart shows uh, the value distribution of an iPhone, an Apple iPhone. And the key here, I think, that's really important is that you see Apple's profits are 58.5%. But if you're looking at the total labor the total amount of value of an iPhone that goes in that goes to workers, um, you're looking at a very small amount. It's 5.3 percent, right? And then if you're looking at how this profit is distributed globally, um, you can see there's a little bit of profit over here for the supplier firms, but the vast majority of it is still concentrated with the company at the head of the supply chain. And that is why in the development literature, and especially uh, Ben Selwyn's work, Nicola Phillips' work, and others, there's been a lot of attention recently um, to arguing that instead of global supply chains, we should be calling these networks uh, global poverty chains or global exploitation chains, because structurally, um, they're perpetuating dynamics of inequality uh, and of, uh, of poverty and of maldistribution of value uh, in ways that build in risks of labor exploitation, environmental exploitation, et cetera. Um, because the margins are so low on certain portions of the supply chain that there's very little value to actually uh, play with. So th this part of the picture tends to be left out of the picture that's painted by companies and governments fighting mod modern slavery. Rather, they want to emphasize that modern slavery or forced labor is something that can easily be eradicated and it can be eradicated without touching this distribution of value. Um, they're not seeing this as a practice that's endemic in retail supply chains linked to these kinds of problems. They're seeing it as something that uh, can be easily targeted and easily eradicated through corporate social responsibility. So I'm just going to touch really briefly on the research that I've done for the book, um, which you can see <laughs> was, was quite a bit. Um, I won't go into sort of all of the details, but what I mainly tried to do on my primary research was I interviewed policymakers, I interviewed industry representatives, um, and I interviewed NGO representatives across the UK, US, Canada, and China. And the reason for that was I was trying to understand how these public and private governance initiatives came about, 
how they were being implemented, what the role of different actors were within them, and what some of the problems were, why they don't seem to work. Um, then, um, I also did a, a survey of consumer goods suppliers at the China Import and Export Fair in Guangzhou, China, where I surveyed the supplier firms who supply to uh, the big brands, and I asked them about things like labor practices, different pressures that they were under, how much time they got to deliver orders, uh, all of those types of questions, trying to understand the root causes of why some uh, suppliers have a uh, a tendency to use sub-minimum wage labor. Uh, I then did factory visits of consumer goods suppliers, and then I did three industry-level case studies to try to understand and hone in on the patterns of how forced labor emerges in these supply chains. Um, for secondary research, I really focused on the CSR policies uh, that incorporate labor standards for the top 100 retail firms, and I also looked into some of the public legislation that's incorporated labor standards uh, since the year 2000. And then I focused in on these audit firms that I'm gonna talk more about in a moment. I really tried to understand what the role of the audit firms and, and their role within supply chain governance was. And finally, I used um, evidence statements that were given to the UK Parliament last year by many uh, Fortune 500 companies, as well as NGOs, which talk a lot about uh, these uh, governance initiatives and some of the shortcomings of them. And on the basis of this research, um, my main argument is as follows, that the reasons that various governance initiatives uh, fail and are, comple are complex, so I'm not trying to say there's one reason that none of these are working to combat slavery, I'm not trying to say that they're equally ineffective across different sectors or across different types of governance initiatives or different parts of the world, I'm saying there, there is complexity and there is variation. Um, but if we step back, I think, which I think is important to do in the context of the literature being very focused on one initiative here, one initiative there, and not really looking at the big picture of how they're fitting together and what some of the larger problems are, I think there are two mutually reinforcing problems that stand in the way of improving labor standards in global supply chains. And that is that both the design and the implementation of these initiatives uh, is severely flawed and limited in ways that tend to benefit the individuals and organizations who are profiting from labor exploitation, but fail to protect workers. So let's look first at the private governance initiatives. So that would be the corporate social responsibility initiatives um, to tackle slavery. So as I mentioned, as part of this shift towards the privatization uh, of supply chain governance and this benchmarking regime that's sort of arisen up to try to um, convey uh, a sense of accountability and concern for labor standards within supply chains, um, industry actors as well as NGOs have taken on roles as monitors and enforcers of labor standards in supply chains uh, through tools like ethical auditing. So ethical auditing is when uh, say I'm Nike, I would hire an audit firm to come in and go look at and monitor the factories in uh, other parts of the world. And this industry, which has sprung up to um, enforce corporate codes of conduct and labor standards um, and is paramount to the fight, you know, the fight against slavery, is a very profitable industry. Um, it's brought a lot of money into accounting firms, to NGOs, as well as to industry actors. Um, but there's very little evidence to uh, suggest um, that they're necessarily creating uh, gains for workers. So in the last five years or so, you've had companies investing millions and millions of dollars in these anti-slavery initiatives. Clothing retailer Abercrombie & Fitch, for instance, claimed in 2010 to have taken proactive steps to mitigate risks of human trafficking and forced labor in their supply chain. Nike now claims that they have taken seriously the federal international efforts to end all kinds of forced labor. And essentially, you've had a shift where companies have gone from saying, we have nothing to do with forced labor, um, forced labor is not in our supply chain, there's no possibility of forced labor in our supply chain to having companies sort of almost be in a race and competing with each other about their social uh, responsibility initiatives in this area. And the main way that they're doing that, as I mentioned, is through this social auditing industry. Um, audits are now the primary tool that companies are using to try to detect and address forced labor in their supply chain. And so as I mentioned, auditing is essentially, it's a tool uh, 
that the companies used to use for sort of internal governance, internal accounting procedures, and now they're using it as a governance tool um, purportedly to, uh, to maintain labor standards and address problems in supply chains. And as I mentioned, it's a profitable industry. Uh, these are some of the, the auditing companies. I think often it's seen as a sort of technical part of supply chain governance because you think, well, what could be wrong with hiring someone to go in and look at uh, the supply chain? Um, but actually, these are for-profit firms, and they've grown dramatically in recent years. Um, and there's also very little evidence to suggest that auditing is leading to concrete gains uh, for workers. Um, there's a lot of reasons for this. I'm going to go into three in particular. Um, and those are going to be that there are limited detection of forced labor through audits. Then when forced labor is found, there's limited reporting. And then there tends to be limited cor corrective action. And I'm going to have to go through these relatively quickly, um, but I'm happy to come back to them in the Q&A. And the main point is to say, I think, that what's often overlooked in discussions of auditing and enforcement in global supply chains um, is the fact that these brand and retail companies who are commissioning the audits are leveraging highly strategic control over the design and implementation of these types of, pro of programs. And as such, the ability of auditors to detect and address forced labor um, tends to be much more limited than people think it should be. So to start off with um, detection, as I mentioned, there's very little evidence to suggest that uh, audits are, a, an, are an effective tool to detect forced labor. Um, the main reason for that is that the retail company who com commissions the audit, so that's Nike, Starbucks, whoever, um, they have full discretion over how deep within the supply chain the audit will go, which portions of the supply chain will be audited, um, et cetera. So as one of the auditors that I interviewed explained, you know, we'll, go to, we'll audit as far into the supply chain as the brand wants us to go. Many retailers, the vast majority of them, only audit their tier one suppliers. So those are their biggest suppliers at the top of the chain. Or they only audit a percentage of those tier one suppliers. Um, so for instance, REI, which is an outdoor store uh, based in the US, um, they audit uh, only a small percentage of tier one factories in the supply chain, which amounts to roughly 27% of their total supply chain. Um, and if we look at the pathway, of these audits, uh, it's not just about numbers. It's also about which types of factories they're auditing um, and which parts of the, of the supply chain they're not auditing. Um, so I want to make the argument that these audits and the pathways of these audits are structured in a way that usually conceals rather than brings to light the worst forms of labor exploitation that are taking place in the supply chain. So what do I mean by that? Well, if you look at the patterns that I was talking about earlier when I had the, the pictures of the commodities and I said, you know, there's research that starts to give us insight into how and where forced labor manifests in these industries, um, it indicates that the worst labor practices are not taking place among the tier one manufacturers where the final assembly is occurring, but rather they're concentrating along the lower ends of the supply chain in lower value added activities. So harvesting, processing, dyeing, finishing, um, et cetera. But these portions of the supply chain don't tend to be covered in audits. So one of the issues that's happening here is that actually as companies are starting to face more audits, um, so tier one factories, they've started turning to unauthorized subcontracting uh, and contracting workers to limit their own legal responsibility. So you've had more and more surveillance through the CSR programs on the top of the supply chain, and that's uh, creating pressures for those companies to outsource work further down the chain, and especially to outsource the bad practices that they don't want to get picked up through the audits. So for instance, many of you might remember the Rana Plaza garment collapse uh, in uh, Bangladesh in 2013, and one of the you know, informants I interviewed remarked many of the brands that found themselves in that factory were as surprised uh, as the next person to find their brand there um, because their defense was, we never gave work to that factory. The people who gave them the work was in the violation of the contract. Um, and, and so there's, you know, sort of everyone turning a blind eye to the fact that 
a lot of the, the places that are being audited are no longer the places where the worst offences are tending to come up and occur. Um, so one of the directors of, of, of a UK audit firm that I interviewed was very candid about this and said, you know, at this point, the majority of supply chain monitoring programs aren't trying to find things out. They're actually trying to prove that something's not there. Uh, so they're very strategic in how they're building the pathway of, of their audits. Um, just to illustrate this point briefly further, don't worry if the diagrams are a little bit uh, simple, PowerPoint and uh, Word are not my strong suit, but essentially if we imagine that P1 to P4 are a product supply chain, so let's say computers again, so you have the retailer and you know back here is like coltan and the different minerals that go into to a computer, um, and you imagine that the audit pathway is proceeding along the P's on the horizontal, the point that a lot of people made is that in many supply chains, uh, forced labor and the uh, worst practices are actually coming in through the labor supply chain, through labor subcontracting, through labor recruitment, through agency workers, through various different types of setups um, where workers are not necessarily on uh, the, the books of the core workforce that's being audited. And therefore, there may not be records uh, of the workers who are subjected to some of the worst forms of exploitation. Again, the patterns vary very much by different industries. They vary by different sectors. I'm not trying to say that it's all and everywhere the same issue. But by and large, I think if we step back, there is a tendency for this, the, the pathway of these audits to be built around the, the product supply chain and especially the portions of the product supply chain in which uh, the most vulnerable workers don't tend to be concentrated. Um, so Apple recently acknowledged this problem. They refunded $4 million in back wages uh, to workers who were victims of bonded servitude, um, which was essentially um, workers who had been charged by third parties excessive recruitment fees that were then used to hold them in situations of debt bondage while they were working uh, within these factories. And it was really interesting in their report because they said, you know, yes, we've sort of been aware of this problem for a long time, but we didn't necessarily see this as part of our problem. Uh, but now we realize this is one of the core drivers of, of forced labor within our supply chain. And so we are going to tackle it. Um, and interestingly, you know, Apple is one of the only companies that's gotten into the issue and, and enc encompassed within its anti-slavery initiatives uh, the problem of recruitment fees and, and debt bondage within its factories. Um, okay, the second weakness that I wanted to mention briefly is limited reporting. So what happens when you have uh, forced labor that is detected by these auditors? Um, well, what it seems to me is that there's very little reporting of the problems of forced labor because the audit firms don't have any obligation to report the findings. Uh, they don't need to report them to the police. They don't need to report them to the public. They don't need to report them to advocacy groups. Rather, these private auditors uh, are, confident, are bound to confidentiality clauses to the companies who commission the audit. So that means that if you commissioned you know, this auditor to go out and, and find forced labor in the supply chain and they find it, um, there's, there, even though that's criminal activity, there's zero incentive and there's actually a lot of disincentives from reporting that to any other party. Uh, and it was really interesting in the, in the Modern Slavery Act um, debates within the parliament, IKEA used what, a report that some co-authors and I had, had written about this and about the problems of auditing to interview, uh, to interview IKEA, sorry, the parliament one of the parliamentarians was interviewing IKEA, and they said, yes, that's how we maintain uh, good relationships with, with our suppliers. You know, if these practices were made public, um, yes, we're suppressing criminality, but on the other hand, we wouldn't be able to do business if, if, if the audit reports were, were reported and things were made public. So once forced labor is found, there's a real tendency to suppress it. Uh, and many of the informants that I interviewed uh, described that Audit reports are confidential to the firm that commissioned them. Um, and occasionally they're sent along to the supplier. But because the audit firms are businesses, uh, their ability to report exploitation and forced labor is very limited. And so these things tend to be sort of pushed under the rug rather than put into, into the public eye. And finally, to touch on the third weakness just very quickly, my interviewees hi uh, highlighted that there's very limited corrective action. So even when these things are reported and when rec careful records are, are made and the audit report clearly shows that there are problems, um, 
they're not necessarily addressed. So that was illustrated uh, by several examples that have come to light recently where you've had uh, audits, audited factories where problems have been reported and nothing has been done and then there has been a catastrophe. So a good example here was the Rana Plaza collapse again, which made clothes for Primark and Walmart and others. Um, and that factory was audited only a couple of weeks uh, before it collapsed in 2013. Problems were found uh, by TUV Reinhardt, the, the auditor. They were reported uh, and yet nothing was done. Uh, and, and companies continued to source from this factory until it collapsed. So I think that really highlights um, some of the problems. And again, just to emphasize, the reasons for this are complex, but the main issue is that retailers are holding full discretion over when these audits take place, what is encompassed within them, what the methodology of the audit is, et cetera. Um, which is why I think one of the, the quotes I had was a very candid thing. He said, even within you know, the social compliance world, um, it's now standard operating understanding that audits don't actually achieve change within organizations. They don't work to create change. So it's interesting then that even though businesses are accepting that, you have NGOs and governments increasingly adopting audits as a tool that they think is going to address the problem of forced labor and supply chains. So ultimately then, I think we have to ask effective for whom is an important question here. Um, these companies are using private governance initiatives like audits, and they're working for those companies. Uh, they're helping position those companies as responsible uh, actors, um, but they don't seem to be doing much for, for workers. And in fact, there's a growing body of research that shows that they might be actually pushing problems further deep into deeper parts of the supply chain where it's even more difficult uh, to find them and to regulate them. So then just to touch really briefly on public governance, um, to make the story a little bit even more depressing, because you think, well, that's okay. We don't expect companies to do much for forced labor, but the state's going to come in and really sort things out. Um, but actually, what we've seen is that at the same time as you've had these companies ramping up their anti-slavery initiatives um, in the context of growing pressure from NGOs, um, you've had all sorts of governments, including the United States, Canada, the UK, passing legislation um, that is all about strengthening governance to combat forced labor. But interestingly, most of this legislation, even though it's, you know, its purported aim is to require businesses to end slavery, has focused on criminal justice consequences for individuals. Um, and where it has touched on business or supply chains, it's tended to be focused on triggering private governance responses. So governments have said, we're not going to tell you guys how to deal with the problems of modern slavery to companies, but you need to do something. And it's basically up to you to do what you want, and then tr you just need to be reporting on what you're doing. So we've had all of these different uh, initiatives that NGOs have been really excited about, anti-slavery initiatives, um, that uh, are, are mostly uh, pushing forward an agenda of transparency. So what's transparency? It essentially establishes a duty on some companies to prepare a slavery statement that reports on any steps they may have taken to address it. Um, the problem with this is that it's viable to report that they're doing nothing. It's also viable to report very generally about the existence of their audit programs or about corporate social responsibility more broadly or their aspirational uh, language about human rights. But it doesn't kind of hold their feet to the fire on specifics on what is the risk of forced labor within your supply chain and what types of measures are you taking to mitigate that risk. And please show us some evidence that those measures are actually effective. Right. Um, also, there's very little, um, there's essentially no punishment for, for companies who don't comply thus far. So we've had the California Act since 2012, the UK Act, and I'm not aware of any uh, companies that have had any consequences for not publishing a statement. And the vast majority of companies covered under both sets of legislation have yet to, to cover or to, to release any statement. So on the one hand, we have all this action on modern slavery, on anti-human trafficking, anti-forced labor, and that's very important. On the other hand, I think what's important to think about, NGOs are really excited about um, this, you know, this body of anti-slavery legislation. They think of it as a success, but it's also coalesced and kind of come alongside with the decline of, of normal labor inspectorates. Um, and I won't go into this too much here. The important point is just to note that in the same period where there's been huge excitement about 
fighting fighting slavery, there's been a, a real decline of resources and, and attention put into labor exploitation more broadly. So the average employer within the U.S. now has a 0.001% chance of being expected within a given year because you've had just a huge cutting back on labor inspection more generally. And a final point on this is just to say, you might think, okay, well, we don't need labor inspectors so much anymore because now we have these private auditors. Um, but there are huge differences between auditors and state labor, uh, state labor inspectors. I won't go into too much of that here. Happy to talk about it more in the Q&A. But the short version is that auditors, they can't investigate. They can't open locked drawers. They have no ability to impose sanctions. They have no ability uh, to, to prosecute. Um, so they can't launch criminal persecution or, or litigation uh, to, for instance, get back wages for workers, et cetera. So, Auditors can only see the portions of the production sites that suppliers choose to show them. And essentially, even though state inspectors are not perfect, um, auditors are, are, are vastly less powerful and vastly less resourced uh, in many ways um, than, than the state inspectors. So the point here is just to say this is not a privatization of state functions. This is a, a displacement of the function of labor inspectorate with a much weaker governance tool. And that's really an important point. So to sum up, what is the problem with all of the anti-slavery legislation? The main thing is that there's been so much excitement about it and so much energy and attention put into fighting slavery. Um, and it's very hard in some ways to disagree with that because obviously it's an urgent problem. It involves a lot of human suffering. It is important to address. Um, but there's been a real tendency to overlook um, the, the substance of what the initiatives that are being passed are actually doing and what they actually require for businesses, uh, which is very little. Um, and also, they don't tackle any of the underlying dynamics within the business model that give rise to forced labor in the first place. So especially that pie chart of value, you know, how are you going to stop forced labor when workers are only getting 5% of the value of the entire iPhone? So it doesn't touch any of that sort of thing. Um, it leaves all the business models that create a demand for forced labor uh, purely intact. And it uh, also does nothing to tackle the status quo of the retail-driven economy um, in the first place. So just to conclude, um, it's, a, it's a bad news story, but it's one that I think is important to put out there, um, which is that there's been a lot of hope and a lot of interest in these public and private initiatives to bolster labor standards and supply chains, um, but they're, they're flawed, and the approach that's being taken is flawed, both in terms of design and implementation. So in terms of design, they tend to omit the portions of the chain that are, that are known to have the more severe forms of labor exploitation. Uh, they're focused on these tier one suppliers, um, and they rarely address the labor supply chain, which are these unregulated networks through which contingent and sometimes forced and trafficked workers are recruited, transported, uh, and supplied to businesses. Uh, they also don't look at these shadow factories where unauthorized production is, is, is accelerating in the bottom tiers of the supply chain, uh, labor subcontractors, or unauthorized factories, or the informal sector. Um, and recent governance initiatives tend to conceal and disclaim responsibility for these spaces rather than bring them to light. Uh, in terms of implementation, we have a similar problem. Most, company, or most countries are scaling back public uh, labor standards inspectorates. They're devolving authority to private actors to enforce their own rules. Uh, and you have a huge industry of accounting firms, social auditors, NGOs to some extent, who have emerged and are very happy to be monitoring and enforcing labor standards. Um, but this enforcement industry seems to be helping companies, but there's very, very, very little evidence. And there's, in fact, a lot of evidence to the contrary that it's doing much in terms of detecting, reporting, or correcting uh, severe labor exploitation. So I think that corporate governance our contemporary governance efforts are failing. They're not protecting the world's most vulnerable workers. And the prospect of strengthening these existing initiatives and the approach that's being taken are also bleak. Um, so ultimately, I think we still have a problem, which is how to 
uh, effectively strengthen and enforce labor standards in supply chains. And my argument would be that that's a political problem, uh, much more than it's a technical one that can be solved by sort of tinkering around the edges of these supply chains. Thank you very much. Hashtag is SOAS Dev Studies, all lowercase. So please go ahead and do that. Okay. Um, thanks very much, Genevieve. I, I thought it was uh, extremely good. Uh, it is extremely important. It's extremely detailed, uh, and it is, of course, an extremely urgent problem. Um, so th this is absolutely fantastic for us. Um, I'd like to ask a few questions, uh, starting from very, very general uh, issues. You, you started the presentation from the ILO uh, definition of forced labor, and it seemed to be that the problem there was uh, a, a, a dis the definition itself expresses a dissatisfaction uh, with personal coercion and a sympathy towards impersonal or market forms of um, the labor relationship. So the problem then for the ILO is not exploitation of labor per se, it's the personalization of the economic relationship uh, and the direct compulsion. But the market compulsion, the impersonal compulsion, is not a problem at all. So the idea implicit in the definition is to shift towards uh, proper capitalist market relationships away from a distorted kind of capitalism that relies on the personal relationship of exploitation. So is this the, the, the framework, the dominant framework in which forced labor is, 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 is understood. Now, if that is correct, then, then what, what, what is forced labor actually? Well, how, should we, how should we see it uh, if all capitalist labor is, is forced, all wage labor is forced in, in a systemic way? What, what, is, what is slavery if all capitalist labor is slave labor in, in a particular way, but it is not slave labor at all in a, in a, in a different kind of way? So what is it that we're actually uh, talking about? So what, what is it that is exploitation of labor in global supply chains if all capitalist labor is exploitative uh, in all circumstances? And it, must be, and it must be so. So would we then eliminate the problem if you raised uh, wages at the bottom of the chain by 50 cents an hour and allowed the workers to leave? Does, does that resolve the problem? Should we be happy then and consider that progress? Um, I'm sure if I were work employed in that situation, I would consider this progress. But is it sufficient? Uh, what else do we? What else do you want? Um, so there is, is there is there a spectrum of poverty at the bottom of those chains and a spectrum of poverty across the the working class in in the world as a whole, employed from the Apple Store down Covent Garden, all the way down the chain uh, in the steps that you have. Uh, described in art, different types of labor in this spectrum of labor, in this spectrum of poverty tied to particular chains and to the production of particular goods and services. And to, is it, uh, can we say this or, or not? And what is the peculiarity of those chains under neoliberalism? What is it that is necessary about those chains and those forms of labor and those forms of poverty? Uh, and what is it that is contingent? Is it just because of greed? by particular uh, retailers or by particular ma global uh, manufacturers? Or is it a problem of that th th neoliberalism weakened the representation of labor and this leads to the deterioration of the position of the workers at the bottom of, of those uh, chains? Or is it a problem of lack of development in particular countries that economic progress itself would spontaneously uh, resolve? Now, towards the end, you described what you call the displacement of labor uh, inspection, but is this is this a failure of uh, governance, uh, or is it the mode of governance of particular production chains uh, of specific goods and services under globalized neoliberalism? What what is the systemic aspect uh, of this? And if this is the case, then what goods and services are we talking about? Wh which ones and which ones are not subject to these modalities of labor and these? particular type of creation of poverty, is there anything systemic again about this? And what are the other commonalities that we can identify other than poverty, forced labor, um, types of slavery, uh, and so on? But uh, in that case, what is it that attracts direct compulsion? Is it again just the attempt to lower costs? Or is there something else that is involved uh, as well in, uh, in that? But, but again, if this is the case, 
what kinds of governance initiatives in your final slide would be appropriate by neoliberal states and then effective to eliminate, to resolve, to address the problem in some kind of meaningful way? Or is it something that we have to say, bah, nothing can happen because the world is really bad and until we overthrow global neoliberalism, nothing is going to happen uh, and we should despair? Probably not, but what is it that can be actually uh, achieved? And then, why is, why is forced labor? And, and, and to conclude, why is forced labor a problem uh, today? Is it because we rebel against a particularly grotesque example of exploitation of a particular subgroup of people and in a way we're illustrating the problems with capitalism by looking at this extreme example or is it because we're being deflected against the systemic problem of capitalism by looking only at that particularly extreme uh, example? What is it that we're looking at in this case? Thanks. including how Marxists have completely misunderstood what unfree labor is. I have a very nice theoretical framework, which is a feminist historical materialist framework to try to understand the role of unfree labor in the global economy. But I'm really trying to stay out of that here. Um, <laughs> but just for the purpose of this, I, I think I agree with you. I mean, yes, the, the, the problems with the ILO definition that have been really, really well pointed out by several uh, people uh, are many, but one of the main ones is that there's a, t a, a complete normalization and a lack of problemization of, of economic coercion and how economic coercion is defined and separated from other forms of coercion. So in a sense, labor is not considered involuntary under their definition if you have no choice but to work because you've been dispossessed of land or of the means of subsistence or uh, of uh, you know, any other way of gaining your livelihood outside of, of money and markets, um, that's not considered to be forced labor. Uh, there's, there's a real tendency to focus on, on, on types of labor that involve uh, specific forms of coercion that can be uh, neatly cut off, I think, from uh, exploitation more broadly. And I mean, one of the main issues with that is that when you actually go and study workers, um, you end up in ridiculous situations of trying to decide whether somebody is a victim of forced labor, whether a victim of exploitation, because, you know, the reality is that labor relations are not that clear cut. Um, they often involve ingredients of, of many types of different compulsions and many types of coercion. And the economic coercion that's normalized within capitalist markets that applies, you know, to, to all workers um, can often be very extreme and can often be uh, the driver that compels people to enter voluntarily into, you know, just egregious labor relationships. Um, but then they are not identified as victims of forced labor and they don't even identify themselves as victims of forced labor uh, because technically, you know, they consented uh, to enter into this relationship knowing that the, the labor relationship would be exploitative in the face of, you know, just a complete lack of alternatives. So um, I think I don't disagree with, with your points on that. Um, I think it is a problem. And one of the problems, kind of going to your last point, is that, you know, why has there been such an, 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 an excitement and a, a kind of obsession with modern slavery under neoliberalism? I think you're exactly right. It's because it's deflected all of the attention away from the normalization and spread uh, and deepening of, of labor exploitation more broadly uh, across the, the sort of spectrum of free and unfree labor, I would say, so-called free and unfree labor. Um, and, and, and it's really interesting to see how, you know, it's, it's such a kind of um, a lightning rod of action and interest in modern slavery uh, at the same time as, you know, things like workers' rights and kind of traditional questions around unions and collective action and other types of things have been completely uh, marginalized and, and, and completely sort of sidelined. Um, a lawyer in the U.S., Janie Chang, has called this exploitation creep. I think that's a really good um, term because she's essentially saying there's been this focus on the tip of the iceberg and a complete neglect of the iceberg, which is 
labor conditions under capitalism more broadly. Um, so I don't, I don't disagree with that. I also uh, think your points about how neoliberalism has weakened the power of labor more broadly uh, are very important. And I guess in terms of the state, I would say, you know, what's really important there has been this historical shift of a rebalancing of class forces within the state, um, where, of course, you know, things like the decline of labor inspectorates, I'm not saying those are a governance gap. I'm saying that those are intentionally um, enacted ways of governing, which is essentially a redefinition of the relationship between workers uh, and employers, whereby employers can uh, exploit workers with relative impunity. And that that has been uh, a very conscious, very deliberate um, measure that, is, that has occurred in the context of many different states. Um, so I, I don't disagree on those points. I guess just to come back to the final, one of the final points you made about, is this all just bleak and do we sit back and wait for, um, <clears throat> what was it, capitalism or neoliberalism or both to fade away? No, uh, I don't think so. I think, I mean, there's a number of different things. One thing that, that's a kind of conjunctural but very easy sort of thing that could be done right now by people who are interested in global supply chain governance is to listen to workers. There are these groups in uh, all over the world. There's uh, the Coalition of in Milwaukee Workers in the US. There's the Asia Floor Campaign uh, in the garment industry. There are groups of workers who are organizing who are saying, if you want to do monitoring of supply chains and you want to do corporate social responsibility, let us do it. Let us have our own worker-led responsibility initiatives. Um, and and they have very effectively, especially in the US, managed to raise the price of labor. They've managed to uh, secure better conditions. They've managed to secure better rights around collective action and to strike. Um, and so I think that you know the question of supply chains, even kind of on its own terms, within that framework that we're operating in right now, uh, there's already options within that. You know, there's absolutely no reason to leave governing and monitoring of supply chains up to companies themselves when workers are actually on the ground uh, and are being marginalized in a lot of these initiatives and are fighting and saying, look, we're happy to do this ourselves. Um, so that's one of the things I'm interested to point out. I'll stop there because I want to hear other comments. Great. Thank you very much. Um, if I could take questions from the floor, we're going to take them probably in twos or threes, depending on how they come. So. Um,
actually um, allow them to have the showpiece factories to, to sort of show. And the fact that they were completely at ease with the CSR model is shown by the fact that as a matter of fact, in India, and my understanding is in Peru, this is starting also, uh, now all over suppliers, they're not demanding for the dismantling of CSR models, they're demanding for incorporating it, to, for endogenizing it. So they want to run it because it's a source of competition. So I wonder how you just mm -hmm. sort of, uh, account for this in, in, in your theorization. And the second one relates to NGOs. And I, like you, I met a lot of you know wonderful people that just dedicate a lot of time to modern slavery initiatives and they're very sort of committed. But my sense is there has been since the 90s a sort of uh, um, reduction of space in terms of the platforms where these actors can actually you know, engage, and it's always on business terms. So in a sense, like uh, modern slavery platforms, uh, but also ETI-like platforms, they're increasingly only financed by business, mm -hmm. and they're increasingly um, only uh, negotiated on business terms, or at the very least the buyers and the suppliers have to be on board. So in a sense, I'm asking you, what does this have about the sweatshop movement itself? Mm in the last two decades. So how do you see the evolution of the movement mm. itself and what are the problems related to that? Thanks. Okay, shall we stop there because we have two <laughs> very big questions. We'll come back in a sec. Okay, uh, I'll go in reverse order. Well, I have it in the top of my mind. Um, I guess starting with NGOs, Alessandra, those are really good questions. I mean, um, I have written elsewhere in another kind of obnoxious uh, short polity book uh, about the corporatization of activism, a book with Peter Deverne called Protesting. And I think that those arguments that we made about how NGOs are under increasing pressure to work with corporations because of cuts and reductions in their funding, uh, because of uh, uh, a kind of real closing up of the space for radicalism um, and, and many other circumstances that are pushing NGOs more and more into partnerships with, with industry, uh, but also that industry are taking a different approach to how they work with these NGOs. And so they want to build into their sort of longer term growth strategy, certain types of collaborations and certain types of partnerships uh, with certain types of NGOs um, and make a big deal of them. Uh, and that's part of how they're maintaining their sort of credibility and social license to operate. Uh, and we made that argument uh, not just about sort of the, the supply chain types and the sweatshop activism, as, as you've called it, but about activism more broadly in relation to social and environmental issues. And I think that those arguments apply. You know, we're not trying to say that this is a sort of straightforward corporate takeover of NGOs, but we're saying that in, in, in the context of this real condensing of space, for certain types of activism. Um, they're choosing to partner up and work increasingly closely with industry. And there are good reasons to do that. Uh, maybe incremental change within the system is becoming slightly more achievable. I'm not sure people flag that as one of the benefits of it. But if you take a step back, there's a lot that's being left off the table. And we think that, you know, I, I think in relation to this book, the modern slavery agenda uh, is leaving a lot off the table in relation to workers' rights and some of the more traditional issues and demands that, that NGOs have pushed for within this movement in the past. Um, so I guess that, that's what I would say on that. In terms of the compliance regime, yeah, I, I absolutely agree that it's been fruitful for suppliers. When I was doing the factory visits in China, um, I mean, and even at the Canton Fair when we were interviewing suppliers, you know, one of the main reasons that I got into this project was because I was walking around the Canton Fair and you'd see all the suppliers with their posters that would have all of the different certifications that they had managed to achieve, all of the different audits that they had passed. So it would say, we've passed Walmart's audit, we've passed Target's audit. And so we became really interested, what is the value of these certifications and these um, you know, being able to pass different types of CSR initiatives to these suppliers. And so when we interviewed them about it, they were very candid and they would, you know, they, a lot of them saw them in, in business terms. They would say, well, if we have these um, certifications and these audits, we can access higher end markets, we can have higher margins, we can outsource more of our production, we can focus on the types of products we want to make. Uh, so there are huge advantages uh, for those suppliers. And I think that's something I would uh, need to bring out a bit more in my in my analysis and in sort of how I set it up at the front end of the theorization. So that's really a helpful point. Um, 
back to your point, um, I guess you start with the part about the, the Veritas uh, Intertech. I mean, they are focused, they, they, they've expanded their services in recent years, so they are focused on the end products, but especially Veritas, increasingly they're also doing uh, more and more type social auditing types of uh, of projects and more and more service providing. So a lot of these firms have gone from specializing in say one type of audit or one type of service are now expanding. And so they've been growing very quickly. Uh, and part of the way that they've been growing is through uh, purporting to and volunteering to um, implement and enforce and monitor these anti-slavery initiatives and other types of supply chain initiatives. Um, in terms of collaboration with elites, um, I think that's a really great point. I, I'll have to think more about it. I didn't look at it very carefully in the research that I did in China, so I don't feel I'm in a good position to comment, but um, I'd be curious to, to get some of your thoughts on it more after as well. Absolutely. Yeah, I'd love to. The lady up there. Uh, yeah, no, I'm pretty. <laughs> on some of these points. Thank you very much. Those are, again, three really useful, uh, helpful interventions. Um, on uh, your point back there, um, on I, yes, I mean, just the one that struck me the most was this, yes, the workers' organizations are missing. Uh, that's in some ways deliberate. Like, I, I, I'm trying to, to show how there's this whole industry and this whole sort of networks that are being built up around fighting exploitation and fighting slavery um, and where are the workers within those you know they're they're very rarely uh, involved and in fact they're very often cut out or within you know international organizations like the international labor organization which you would think would be an institution that would be in many ways uh, dedicated to empowering workers and 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 their voices even within that you know they're facing a lot of challenges in 
getting a seat at the table and when they have a seat at the table and getting any kind of meaningful involvement in these types of initiatives. So I think that's right that you picked up on that. And the truth of the matter is, um, I think a lot of unions and a lot of different workers groups are really now catching on and, and embracing the kind of modern slavery agenda. For a long time, they have been resistant to it because it's been seen as something that's been trying to marginalize their other concerns by focusing on the worst forms of, of exploitation. Um, and, and now many of them, including some of the uh, groups that um, I recently worked with at the International Labor Organization's ILC convention on um, supply chains, it happened last summer, they've really taken on this sort of discourse of modern slavery and they're using it um, to try to make arguments and demands uh, that, that they were trying to make anyway, but they're now sort of using the political capital of modern slavery to push forward some of those agendas. And so I think that we're going to start to see more workers' demands uh, to get involved in some of these processes, and I think that that's a very good thing. Um, in terms of the uh, the legality of audits, I just also want to mention that there are a number of lawsuits and complaints against audit firms that I think are really interesting that are happening right now. There was a lawsuit against PricewaterhouseCooper in the U.S. It just recently it dealt with uh, financial fraud, not uh, forced labor. Um, but and there's another one against uh, TUV Rhine uh, Lend, who are the firm that audited the Rana Plaza collapse uh, factory. Um, and these complaints are essentially really important because they're they're going to be some of the first times that the legal status of audit reports is is actually going to be um, deliberated upon. So the audit firms have said we don't have a legal requirement to be accurate in our in our audit reports. We just have a legal requirement to do the audit, and there's no obligation or need. You know, we're, we can't be liable if if we're inaccurate. Uh, and so the courts are actually looking at that right now. Do these audit firms have an obligation and a legal requirement for accuracy? Um, and, and so that's a big sort of frontier that's moving forward. So um, I would keep an eye on those lawsuits. Um, in terms of the numbers with the ILO, I mean, uh, <laughs> let me speak delicately here. They have a whole methodology paper where they spell out how those numbers are collected and, and how they've come up with this estimate. As I mentioned, you know, there are a number of other estimates of modern slavery um, that have basically no statistical basis and no basis in evidence. So there's a global slavery index, uh, which is produced by an NGO, which purports to measure the numbers of victims of slavery in every country in the world um, down to the individual. So it'll say yeah, there's 16,424 victims in this country or whatever. Uh, and those numbers are, are very problematic because they're based on a very small number, maybe 15 to 18 national level surveys, and then they've extrapolated to all of the other countries in the world on the basis of this 20 surveys. So those are really not credible. Um, by comparison, the ILO numbers at least have a methodology behind them that's transparent uh, and that's published and that you know statisticians and others have, have looked at. Um, but what's interesting about that number, the, the 21 million number, are, is that they I mean, there's a few things. One is it's a, it's based on regional estimates, so there's no national surveys that are involved. Uh, so they're estimating by region. They won't give country level estimates of forced labor for the different countries in the world. Um, and then there's also these issues like duration, right? They don't specify um, how long did a person need to be a victim of forced labor to be included in, in the number? Um, what about the people for whom uh, economic exploitation sort of com forms of compulsion and coercion were very dire. They're also not included in the number. So a lot of people have really um, criticized that number for being exclusive and exclusionary of people who are in horrendous labor conditions all around the world. Um, but it's also been criticized on methodological grounds uh, for various different issues like duration, etc. cetera. Uh, and they're coming up with a new number that I think will be out in 2017 or 2018, which will be their new global estimate, um, which will be based on national surveys. Uh, so they are doing the work of collecting, you know, doing national prevalence surveys. And obviously it's very difficult to, to do those, right? Like you're trying to find something that you're trying to investigate a practice that's illegal, that companies and governments don't want you to research. Um, so it is very hard to do that work, but they are doing it. And so we can expect a better number and better statistics to be coming out soon. 
Um, finally, on the sector-specific laws, I think that's a really important point. I think it's really interesting that so many of the countries who have, you know, almost every country in the world has made forced labor illegal, right? Almost every country except for the U.S., interestingly, uh, and a couple of others have signed on to the ILO's 1930 Convention Against Forced Labor, and therefore forced labor is illegal within their countries. Many countries like the U.K. even have additional laws like the Coroners and Justice Act that recriminalize forced labor. So forced labor is illegal already within a lot of these countries. I'm not a kind of lawyer, but I do think it's it's kind of fascinating that then there have been this whole wave of anti-slavery legislation that make no reference to those existing laws. Um, and so I do think that, uh, especially if there's some folks who are interested in trade law, who are interested in um, labor law, who are interested in, in kind of national legislation, it would be a really interesting thing to look at potential for um, kind of combining or using some of the laws that have a bit more bite behind them uh, and that importantly have sanctions uh, for non-compliance and thinking about how maybe those could be used uh, or built into you know new forms of initiatives to combat uh, forced labor. Right. Any more comments? I see that people are okay. We'll definitely be able to fit in the last round, I think. Um, Thanks, Genevieve, for a very interesting presentation. I'm sure the book will be a very useful intervention, not least for showing that the paraphernalia of CSR and auditing reproduces the status quo. And I know that you're trying to avoid discussion of these issues in this book to some degree through your response to Alfredo, but isn't, isn't part of the, cri the critique inevitably, doesn't it inevitably involve a discussion of uh, class relations in and around the production process, balance of class forces and source areas, uh, labour control regimes, even if you're not in this book talking about those things in precisely those terms. Mm -hmm. um, Is that okay? One more and then I think, I think we can... Okay. Gentlemen here. Sure. Uh, yeah.
yeah i mean thanks so much those are really great points um and i'll think about them all a lot um i think to answer quickly about the state yes there are laws on the books uh, there's labor law there's all sorts of laws on the books in countries where suppliers operate um uh, and it's you know in some ways it's interesting that the focus has been on strengthening what's being called home state regulation so the 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 regulation from the countries where multinational corporations are incorporated as opposed to doing anything um, with the laws on the books in, in other countries. Um, uh, and I think that that's something that um, needs to be thought more about and, and the whole sort of paradigm of home state legislation uh, needs to really be looked at, I think, quite critically. Um, also in terms of the state, you know, within that sort of trajectory, there are differences and, and that's a great question. I mean. Brazil is a really interesting example because Brazil, um, uh, you know, not just made slavery illegal, but they created sanctions. So they they ramped up labor inspection and they created a blacklist so that any con company who was found to be guilty of what they called modern slavery uh, was banned from from doing business for uh, two years in Brazil. Um, and they had this, you know, going strong uh, for several years. Um, it's more recently, I think, come under fire because they've had a government change and there's been, I think, some concern that this is um, uh, not making businesses very happy. But, you know, there are models that states can adopt. And that was a very good one, uh, at least in the time that it was uh, going strong, uh, whereby it did seem to lead to concrete, measurable improvements um, be, by creating a culture where, you know, companies uh, couldn't just operate with impunity. There, there were consequences uh, for uh, the implementation of illegal labor practices. Um, in terms of John's question, I'm going to say yes, I do need to think about those things. And I'm still thinking about them. <laughs> Maybe you want to help me. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I think that's all I'm going to say about that right now. Big questions still puzzling over how to address them in a way that is adequate, that doesn't kind of completely overshadow the argument that I'm trying to make, which is much more about the, the sort of way that elites are handling this question, uh, and especially the kind of what companies are getting out of framing the problem of, of, of severe labor exploitation in this way, um, and all of the sort of industry that sprung up around that. I mean, that's my main focus and main interest. Um, I appreciate the point that I can't completely skirt around, you know, the broader sort of class issues and, and I'm not trying to, but I'm trying to find a way to integrate that argument and a kind of coherent nuanced argument about that that doesn't completely take away the focus from uh, the questions of how CSR is being used to uphold um, certain types of relations. So I'm still, I'm still working on that. Um, and I'd welcome your input about how I could do that effectively in my book. Um, I guess maybe the last question, just on the consumer, the consumer question. I mean, I think that's a really tricky one. Um, I am, it is the case that there are so many instances now of certified, you know, plantations or certified products that are fair trade, that are ethically certified in some way, um, that there are discoveries of, of endemic sort of labor practices that are not good, uh, that do not meet the standard of those certifications on those farms uh, or, or plantations or, or work sites. So I don't think they're a guarantee. And I think it's really frustrating because you go to the grocery store and you think, well, I'll spend three more pounds on tea. And you know, you work hard and you make your extra three pounds and you spend it on tea thinking at least I'm not buying products made with forced labor. Um, but the reality is that I think a lot of those certifications are coming under scrutiny. Uh, and I think that there's reason to be worried about um, the sort of industry that sprung up around them and where that money is actually going and that sometimes it's not actually going to, to workers. Um, in terms of alternatives, um, again, that's a really tricky one. I think that the more rigorous the standards are, the better. So there's huge variation. For instance, rainforest certification. You know, if you look up what they actually mean when they talk about 
uh, labor standards. It's extremely vague. It's extremely aspirational. That's very different to me in some ways than looking up uh, a standard that would be a lot more rigorous and a lot more specific about what it is that they're auditing to, et cetera. So if you look at company codes of conduct or you look at some of these certifications, you'll find everything from zero tolerance for forced labor to we aspire to better human rights in our supply chain, right? So just having a really, you know, doing a bit of research and figuring out what some of these um, certifications are and who's actually doing them and, you know, whether they have even a coherent set of practices that they're auditing to, those types of things are very important because you'll find that there's huge differences in quality uh, around those uh, consumer facing labels and products. Um, so I'd encourage you to like, look into that and share your knowledge with your friends and, and everyone else. Um, I think I'll leave it there. That's a hopeful note, right? Leave it on a hopeful note.